Good evening. Thank you. And yeah, I first met Richard when I invited him to come talk to a class I was teaching at UCSD on sustainable development. Um, and he was kind enough to come down and talk about environment and security matters. And we've enjoyed a collaboration ever since then. So I have two positions now. I'm at the Sustainability Solutions Institute at UCSD. And I also teach in the Rady School of Management, which is our new business school. I have a PhD in political science. In, um, I had undergraduate degree in international relations. I worked for a while um, at the age of 40. I got my first mid-career next degree, my PhD. And then uh, this last August, <laughs> I completed an MBA as my second mid-career degree. Um, because over the course of my 30-some years of working, I came to the realization that if we're really going to save the planet and if sustainability is really going to take hold, uh, the private sector needs to be an integral part of the solutions, and it has to be, there has to be a way to make money, to be successful, to have our economy be healthy, and to live within the bounds of our environmental systems. And so I went to, back to school to get my MBA to learn the language and the concepts of business so that the, the ways that, that we've been following that made us overly consumptive overly consuming that got us into this problem. Um, business school people know how to influence our behavior. That's what marketing is all about. Well, I'd like to use that same approach to market sustainable behavior, to, to basically market the planet rather than the stuff that we can make from it. So I'm teaching um, corporate ethics, business ethics and corporate responsibility, and I'm teaching organizational leadership and uh, corporate strategy in the environment to undergraduates and master's students. So anyway, um, today I'm going to talk about sustainability in the university. And I have two uh, primary points. See if my universities create the future. Um, and the way we do that is through education through discovery, and through example. And I'll talk about each of those in a moment. And the thing that um, determines our effectiveness in creating a sustainable future, the things that drive us are our culture, our governance systems, and the resources that are available to us on the universities. So there have been some smart people thinking about this stuff for a long time. Um, this is one of them. And I think um, he was pretty wise, and I'm sure he wasn't talking specifically about sustainability, but I think it applies, that we need to change the way we think about things if we're going to find effective solutions. Now, when we talk about education, sustainability education can happen in all disciplines. It does happen in all disciplines. These are just the, the departments and programs at UCSD. I'm sure you have a similar list uh, for Irvine and, and the other uh, campuses in the UC system and around the country. And at UCSD, we offer a lot of classes. We have lots of instructors teaching things related to sustainability, but we don't have a holistic concept of sustainability education. And it is more than just a series of courses about discrete topics. Um, and we have done an inventory of all of our sustainability and, and environment-related classes. We counted last year, we have 180 undergraduate and 72 graduate sustainability courses, even though they don't necessarily say sustainability in the title or even in the course description. I actually paid an intern to read the entire UCSD course catalog and figure out which classes um, would be considered environment or sustainability <coughs> classes. Um, we have 28,200 students enrolled in these classes. It's not discrete students or maybe the same student taking three or four of these different classes, but the number of students total enrolled in these various classes. We have 30 classes that are cross-listed in more than one department. 22 departments have classes included in this list. And we have instructors from 32 different departments. So if you just want to look at numbers, we're doing a lot of stuff. And I don't know what the inventory is here or if you have one, but but what we haven't done is tie a big green ribbon around it so that people can find these classes easily. If you're a student, it still takes some work to figure out what's possible, what's the right set of courses to take. And we haven't engaged in new ways of thinking about it. So without, and, I, and I'm going to be very candid here because I'm not on my home campus and 
people at UCSD can't see this video unless we let them, right? Uh, so <laughs> but without leadership and vision, um, we're really looking at sustainability with conventional lenses. And I think it takes more than that to be effective. So we're teaching about sustainability in our traditional disciplines. We're teaching multi-departmental courses. We're teaching some interdisciplinary courses that aren't specifically tied to a department. So you could have a course around water that would have lots of different disciplines participating or a course about energy. And we have independent studies. Um, but I don't think that's enough. And I, don't, I think there are motivated students who can leave the university having taken some of these classes and they will be able to make a contribution to sustainability. <laughs> But I think if we were designing our university around sustainability, we would have a different structure. So another really smart person, Amory Levins, said the best way to have good new ideas is to stop having bad old ideas. I think he's right. Um, one of the universities that has been pretty innovative is the University of British Columbia. They had a, a workshop, a, a retreat, to talk about sustainability education. And this is an excerpt from what they decided was the right way to do it. First, they said we should learn how my school works. Then we should learn how to think about the world. Now, these don't sound like course titles of any courses that are offered on my campus. Um, learning how, uh, first was learning how to think about the world, learning how the world works, learning how to create social change, and learning how to keep track of learning. And they put those into a broader framework this is what the whole picture looks like. And each of those five topics has people associated with it, has actions associated with it, has outcomes associated with it, and they're tracking their progress moving through that whole maze of activities. And one of the things they did was look at textbooks and see whether um, we have the right textbooks to teach sustainability. And this is a report called Failing the Earth that evaluated economics textbooks. Introductory economics textbooks in current use are poorly suited for Econ 101 courses at institutions that have made a commitment to sustainability and are seeking to integrate sustainability across the curriculum. So we don't have the right textbooks. How can we be effective in teaching? And it's worse than that. It's not just that they don't cover the stuff. They cover it wrong. The standard textbooks may well confound or even impair student understanding of the nature of our environmental predicament. They presume that increased output and consumption is desirable, that it enhances well-being, and imply, despite empirical evidence indicating otherwise, that richer countries have less environmental impact than poorer countries. They include little or no content that might enhance student understanding of the role that less consumerist lifestyles in rich countries and that redistribution of wealth might play in moving towards sustainability. And this report's available on the web. They actually name textbooks by name. Several of them have Nobel laureates as authors. They have um, authors who care about the environment, who talk about the environment. In some textbooks, it's not even mentioned, or it's just mentioned in the chapter on externalities as a footnote. Um, but even well-intentioned, well-meaning economic uh, academics are not providing us with the tools we need to teach this in a way that might actually get us to a different kind of world. And it's not just economics. I don't have a comparable study in other fields, but I'm sure it's the case. I know from the things I've tried to teach. So here's some of the classes that we're teaching at UCSD, and, and I don't think any of them has an adequate textbook. Conservation and the Human Predicament, Science and Technology in the 20th Century as an Arts and Humanities class, Flow and Transport in the Environment, Environmental Challenges, Science and Solutions, economics of the environment. And this is the one I teach, business ethics and corporate responsibility. We have lots of readings and cases and things that we put together, but there really aren't good textbooks yet to help us teach these things. Um, there are other models of sustainability education. One of them that we talk about a lot is Arizona State University. Um, they've basically remade the university. They advertise as being the new American university. Mike Crow, the president of Arizona State, is a, a very active speaker on the sustainability circuit. I don't know if he's ever been here or you've heard him. But he, re, he basically blew up the university and remade it. And they have a bachelor, master, and PhD in sustainability. You don't have to be in a particular department. 
you can put together a degree program around a theme. And um, it was made possible, he did this because he believed passionately in it, and he also got a $250 million gift from a donor who believed in what he was doing. It's always easier to make change when you have money um, to support you. But the reason he got the money was because he went to donors in Arizona and he said, we're going to deal with the problems Arizona is facing. We have rapid urbanization and a desert environment. And those two things don't go together well. So I'm committing the resources of Arizona State University, the intellectual capacity we have here to solving these problems. And the donors open their checkbooks. And he's been able to recruit some really outstanding people. And I keep saying if, if Arizona State University was in some place anyone might want to live in, they'd have even better faculty, but nobody's going to, very few people are going to leave San Diego to go live in Phoenix, thankfully. Um, they have taken a few people, they have recruited a few people from UCSD. Um, if they lived in a more attractive place, I think they'd have a lot more. And it hasn't been without controversy. But I've heard him, I've met him, I've talked to him, and he said that he committed, when he announced that they were doing this, that he would personally review every academic file for when professors come up for promotion and tenure decisions. The reason, one of the reasons professors don't want to do interdisciplinary things is because they have to get tenure from their department. And their department values things that fit in their discipline. And whether their publications are in journals <coughs> that relate to their discipline. And if you're doing interdisciplinary work, you might be publishing in other journals, or there might not be journals yet for the things that you're, pub that you're doing research on. And he wanted to make sure that no one was disadvantaged when it came to promotions and tenure because they were working on sustainability stuff that was inherently interdisciplinary, that their departments didn't penalize them. And so he made that commitment and he tried to make it safe and in fact to be rewarding to create the right incentives for his faculty to work on sustainability issues and for students to work across departmental lines. Um, so this is some of the information from their website. The Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science degrees are flexible, interdisciplinary, and problem-oriented. Our undergraduate programs introduce students to the problems of sustainability, taking a comparative approach. Students will learn about factors that determine the sustainability of human institutions, organizations, cultures, and technologies in different environments. I wouldn't mind going back to school to do that. Um, it actually sounds kind of cool, and they have beautiful facilities. Um, they address linkages between people in their social, natural, and built environment. And they have Master of Arts, Master of Science, and PhD programs. Um, so they're, they're <coughs> trying to walk the walk, and we'll see how it goes. They, you know, their state has budget problems like everybody else, but they seem to be holding on to the, um, to the effort, that, the commitment they've made. Um, another one is Oberlin University, Oberlin College, to go to the, from the lar really large to the really small scale. Um, and David Orr, is, I guess going to speak, he's one of your speakers coming up, you should ask him about this. Um, I heard him talk at a conference recently and he was talking about how the college and the, the city, the town of Oberlin, are working very closely together um, to create a, a green arts district. And um, it says if, um, if Orr, is successful, they could have the first of its kind in the region, an energy self-sufficient, carbon neutral, possibly even carbon negative community block. And the students at Oberlin College are an integral part of creating this, studying it, being part of it. Um, most proponents of the Oberlin project, now in its initial planning stages, envision the project as an economic catalyst for a new green economy throughout North East Ohio and across the American Rust Belt. So this is another integrated uh, town and gown kind of effort. And I don't know a lot about what's going on at Oberlin, but I did find this on their web page. They've got political issues in their sustainability office, and the sustainability <coughs> manager for Oberlin College um, may be in trouble, and it says that the issue has to do with the amount of attention paid by the college to large-scale movements like the Green Arts District and attention given to small-scale environmental movement organized by students. So um, it's not an easy thing to make change and everybody's got a different idea of what it involves. So you know, it's not easy being green even at a progressive liberal arts college where it seems like change would be a lot more facile than it is at a big institution like a UC campus. 
but there are lots of different experiments going on, there are lots of people trying, and there are lots of organizations who are around and who, which have developed to support this. Um, AISHI is the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. Um, the Disciplinary Act Association Network for Sustainability, which is um, like the American Economic so Society, American Economic Association, I guess it's called it, the American Political Science Association, all the different discipline specific organizations, the sustainability branches of those have come together in this group called DANS to see how they can share best practices of getting uh, sustainability incorporated into each of these disciplines. Um, Second Nature supports sustainability education and they were the instigators of the American College and University President's climate commitment that the University of California system has signed on to to make not only to make every university campus carbon neutral but also to incorporate sustainability into the um, educational curriculum of every college student in the United States and the Council of Environmental Deans and Directors is another one where the organization has been formed to share best practices and provide support and lessons learned across different um, institutions. So the educational piece, there's a lot going on. I don't think we've yet figured out a model or a set of successful models, but there are experiments taking place and we're learning all the time how to do it. We have some networks to help us share best practices and, and get the lessons from those efforts. So we create the future through education. We also create it through discovery or research. And the reason that research is so important is that um, people have become aware of sustainability in the environment, as Richard said. It's, it's high on surveys of things people care about. But do we have solutions? OK, so now we've got your attention world. You know, We know you care about this. What do we do about it? That's the next question people ask. Will we be ready? Do we have the knowledge? Will we have the technological infrastructure? Do we have professionals with practical training? Uh, will the stakeholders and end users be engaged? This is the, these are the questions that universities need to be able to answer in the affirmative. On the technological infrastructure, um, do we know how to monitor complex ecological webs? Uh, we've, there's a lot of work going on on this campus at UCSD and elsewhere on biosensors, on distributed sensor networks environmental metagenomics, can we, can we tell what's happening and how things are changing? Comprehensive Earth observations, what I used to do in my first career at NASA and NOAA is work on all the environmental satellites that take all the data and provide us with a sense of an awareness of what is going on. Um, there's a movement to create a global Earth observation system of systems, a network of all the satellites and ground-based sensor networks. And do we have the socioeconomic and cultural assessment tools? Because we don't just need to know what the plants and animals and, and uh, fault lines are doing. We need to know what the institutions are doing and what the people are doing. And that takes a lot of infrastructure just to collect the information and analyze it. And that brings us to a new field that we call sustainability informatics. How do we put all this together, massive amounts of data, and make some sense out of it? So our two campuses are the homes of Cal IT2. Um, our Sustainability Solutions Institute is actually housed in the Cal IT2 building um, at UCSD. And when we use the term sustainability informatics, we're talking about the convergence of earth science, biology, social sciences, enabled by information technology, leading to a continuous awareness of the earth's systems and their interactions with human activities. And at the end of the day, what we hope to have, the ability to create, is something we call knowledge action networks. So we collect information, we, we collect data, we turn it into information, and we use it to do something. And how do we do that? Um, it's a hard thing to do. We need to understand what we call socio-ecological system dynamics. Lots of big words there. The idea is it's not that the nature is changing and the humans are apart from it watching, or that humans are doing things and nature is apart from it sort of being impacted. It's the interaction, the integration of socio social and ecological factors, um, dynamic nature and dynamic societies. Um, sustainability is a place-based activity. Um, we're talking about, about uh, impacts and interactions that are unique to every particular place, um, multiple stressors in the same location, 
and things that are happening at a local scale that are impacted and embedded in regional, national, and global scale processes. And we're talking about complexity. <laughs> Sustainability is really hard because it's basically everything. And, um, and yet we need to have that perspective in order to come to meaningful um, understanding. And we are working at local, regional, as well as global scales. So um, a research-driven sustain, research sustainability solutions, which is what we're aiming for, require that we observe globally, assess regionally, and act locally. And then, when we're taking action and partnering with people in the field, we need to learn from the locals. They have their own indigenous knowledge. We need to integrate back at the regional scale and see what all this means, all this collection of local activities, and coordinate and commit globally. So there are problems at all these different scales. The climate problem is not going to be solved just by individuals, but, it's, but it needs individual action and it needs collective global action, and at all levels in between. We have things that individuals can do, we have things states can do. California has a climate change legislation, so we're all measuring our emissions and soon going to be required to reduce them. Um, we're part of a Western Governors Alliance, so there are things taking place at regional scales. Someday we'll have national legislation and a policy on climate change at the national scale. And then we have international commitments like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. All of those pieces are necessary and we need to learn how to integrate at all those different levels. So I went back and looked at what we thought we were doing at UCSD five years ago when we started the Environment and Sustainability Initiative. And this was our vision in about 2005. So first we were going to integrate our fundamental capabilities and each of those boxes is a discipline basically or an area of expertise. The little green squiggly thing at the bottom, the Venter Institute, um, Craig Venter, the guy who sequenced the first human genome and who's an alum of UCSD has set up a branch of his uh, Genomics Institute in San Diego. It was going to be on our campus and maybe someday will be when the economy turns around, but working with the Venture Institute. Um, enabled by sustainability informatics, I've already talked about Cal IT2, our supercomputer center, our library system, and so on. And from that we would focus strategically and identify these themes that would be the driving forces for our research and our teaching. So we had um, informatics, we had understanding and conserving biodiversity, sustainable coastal cities, globalization of air pollution and climate change, sustainable enterprise, sustainable energy, and we figured there would be other problems or themes that would come along. Um, interestingly enough, we didn't really have water on there as a specific topic, and now we've ended up focusing uh, most of our efforts on water. But from these, from these themes, we would develop specific uh, research and teaching initiatives and hopefully build solutions and something would come out the other end. Um, we thought we would have an institute. At the time, it was called Environment and Sustainability Initiative Institute. And then we talked about having a nonprofit that would be the kind of boundary organization because there are things that need to be done that are very difficult for a university to do. And sometimes it's easier to work outside the university system, but to have linkages. And um, this nonprofit international network would be the place where all the players would come together and it would link our research to the outside world. Um, and we would create these knowledge action collaboratives, work with government and business, provide feedback into the teaching and research because as we learn more things, we want to constantly be teaching things that are current, things that are um, informed by our experience in the field, and we would train people and run workshops and so on. And it doesn't look quite that way, but we've actually accomplished more than I realized before I put this together um, in our Sustainability Solutions Institute. We're still very small. We've raised about um, between three and four million dollars since we got started. We have one very large grant from the California Energy Commission and one very large donor, large on our scale, not large on the Arizona State scale. Um, and we uh, have focused on three main themes, which are integrated water <coughs> management, the built environment, and what we call greenovation, or the commercialization of sustainability innovation. And on the water theme, we're working at the local scale. We have a feasibility study going on of 
whether the UCSD campus can become water neutral by 2020. Is there a way we could become self-sufficient, either literally or de facto through like trading and, and credits and so on? We don't really know what that means at this point, but we're working very closely with the campus operations staff who make sure that clean water comes out of the faucets when we turn them on, um, to see where what is our energy footprint. First thing we had to do, of course, was figure out well, where are we today so we can see where the opportunities are for making improvements and monitor our progress toward that. Where would we like to be able to do things differently? We have economists working on behavioral aspects. So how do we charge people? Our housing, student housing is all self-sufficient. The students get a bill that covers the cost of electricity and water and all the utilities that they use. So if every student got an individual water bill, would they take shorter showers? Um, you know, can we try that in one of the dorms and not in another dorm and see if it makes a difference? This is, this is using the campus as a learning laboratory. We can figure out how the UCSD campus could be water neutral. We could figure out how San Diego could be water neutral. So let's experiment on the campus where we control all the buildings. We can put meters and sensors and things in it. Um, in the different facilities. The problem with water is the whole campus had like three water meters for the entire campus. And that doesn't help you very much to know who's actually using the water. So one thing we've done is work with a local company that makes things called barnacles, which are sensors that hook onto the outside of the water pipes and somehow measure how much water's going through them. And they give us additional meter readings, in effect, without having to cut open the pipes and actually install meters. Um, so some of it is a technology, some of it is behavioral. We've got engineering faculty, economics faculty, the operations staff, and we're running a technical seminar series where we've invited innovators from outside the campus to come and tell us what they've done in their organizations. Uh, one of the native tribes that, um, that runs, I think it's the Viejas tribe, I'm not actually sure which one, they've become a very proficient in, in water conservation. We had somebody come in and show us a desalination plant that doesn't use a lot of energy, because obviously we have lots of water, it's just salty, and it's expensive under current technology to desalinate it. Um, so who's got something that might work for our campus? Have them come in, give a talk, let us kick the tires, try it out. And for the businesses, it's a chance for them to have a demonstration project that they can then get smart students to help them evaluate what they're doing, learn from that before they go out into the private sector or take their success story from UCSD out and sell that to other customers. Um, from the local scale, we go all the way up to the global scale where we've run a series of workshops on the impacts of climate change on water resources in Himalayan Asia where the glaciers are melting. For a while, we're going to have too much water and then we're going to have no water. Um, in Africa, where water is a driving force in food security. Um, and at the sort of regional scale, we work in Venice, Italy, with the people who are building the floodgates on helping them understand how to manage the Venice Lagoon. They've built these enormous floodgates that are almost finished to keep Venice from flooding when they have high tides and storms and sea level rises. But when they close the floodgates, they close off the circulation of the water through the lagoon. And that has implications for all the things that live in the lagoon ecosystem. So they're trying to figure out how to manage the lagoon, what data do they need to collect, and how should they be evaluating the impact of the floodgates on the operation of the lagoon, on shipping, on tourism, as well as the fish and other things that live there. So we're very involved with the folks in Venice. So um, we are doing a sustain, we do have a sustainability solutions institute. Um, it's not as big or as well funded as we'd like it to be, but it's it's an experiment. It's making it's having an impact. We are not a department. We are not a uh, center. We have no institutional structure that that anyone can define. It's just a very small staff. We just declared ourselves to exist, and we're doing it. And we report to the vice chancellor for research, who has responsibility across the whole campus. So. That's the discovery part. Um, our effectiveness, I said, is driven by culture, governance, and resources. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those. Our um, research opportunities, the UC system <coughs> is rich in resource, research uh, capacity. We have excellence across the board. We have unique assets like Scripps Institution of Oceanography and Cal IT2, the San Diego Supercom Supercomputer Center, a history of innovation and commercialization, strong international collaborations, 
partnerships between research and operations, the examples I was giving about using the campus as a test bed. And the state of California, despite its problems, is supportive of environment and sustainability issues and does fund some research that we do. Um, so here's one example of using the campus as a living laboratory. This is a project called DEMROS, which stands for something and I can't remember. Um, but it's a, an engineering professor designed these micro weather stations and puts them on top of buildings. Students actually build them and install them. And the question he's trying to answer is, how much variability is there across the UCSD campus? So we have Scripps Institution of Oceanography right on the beach. We have the main campus a little bit up the hill and inland. We have other facilities way inland. And in San Diego, I'm sure it's true here, I don't know what, where your weather station is, but for all of San Diego, the official weather reporting station is the airport. So if you're designing a building, you're supposed to design it to meet the weather conditions as reported at Lindbergh Field. But we know perfectly well that it, at the beach, the weather conditions are different than they are inland. And for the campus, they use one, they used to use one algorithm for setting the temperature for all the buildings. They used to not put, we can't put solar panels down at Scripps because the marine layer, it's too foggy, the panels won't be effective. You can't build buildings with windows that open because there's too much salt in the air and it'll corrode stuff inside the building. And some of the engineering professors said, well, how do you know? Have you actually made measurements? Do you know what the difference is in the effectiveness of solar panels at Scripps versus the main campus? And the facilities people said, well, no, but you can see. I mean, it's always foggy in the morning, so obviously. And the engineering faculty pushed back and said, look, we're a data-driven <laughs> campus. We're researchers. Let's figure this out. So Jan Kleisel is the professor's name. He designed these little stations. Some of them are down at Scripps. They're all over. We've got about 15 of them around the campus. And he's actually making measurements of temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind, and so on. This is just a, an example of the data. Each of the different colors is a different reporting station. And over the last year, he's been collecting data to see how much difference there is um, in different parts of the campus. And one of the questions is, how often do you have, the research questions are things like, how often do you have to make measurements? Do you have to, does it change hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, every 15 seconds? I mean, what's the right level of, of sampling? Um, how many different parameters do you need? And he's concluded that it's only about a 10% difference between Scripps and the main campus, or being at the coast and being inland as far as the efficiency of solar panels. Um, and he's continuing to collect this data, and the operations people are using it, so now they adjust the temperatures differently in the different buildings. They plan differently. And, um, and he's also designed some uh, soil moisture sensors so that the athletic fields can be irrigated when they're dry and not every third day because the clock says it's every third day and that's when we water. Um, so we've been able to cut back on our water use by being very focused on um, what the soil moisture conditions are. So um, some of our challenges are our culture, and I think this is true of the whole UC system and not just UCSD, but um, our faculty got there because they were entrepreneurial. They're ind individual achievers, and they take great pride in deciding what they're going to study and how they're going to study it, and nobody can tell them what they should study. I couldn't go in and say, okay, aardvarks are the most important thing. We're all going to study aardvarks this year. They'd throw me out of the room. You know, they'll study what they want. Um, the system is driven by tenure, and so f junior faculty want to find low-risk opportunities. They want to wait till they get tenure before they do anything that's um, too dramatically different from what the people before them have done, and the people who have to vote on their tenure decision. It's elitist. They only want to work with the best, and if they're not sure whether you're good enough, they won't work with you. One of the things we've been able to do for a climate scientist, wants to work with a demographer, wants to work with a, an anthropologist, they don't know who's good. They don't know how to evaluate the quality of faculty or of collaborators in other disciplines because they don't come from that culture. And they don't want to risk their reputation collaborating with the wrong person. I mean, what if this turns out to be some person who's not respected in his field. And so we've been able, through the Sustainability Solutions Institute, to be sort of a 
good housekeeping seal of approval. We, we sort of check people's references. We bring people together at conferences, let them meet each other without any commitments of collaboration. If they like what they found, if they enjoyed the interaction, if they found the person's presentation interesting, then they might go forward and collaborate. But a climate scientist is not going to go to the annual meeting of the, Demog the Demographic Society of America or the Sociology Convention because they just don't have the time and that's not what they do. So they don't have time to do this, figure this out on, on their own, and they don't want to take the risk. You know, they know how to work in their own fields, and so that's a barrier that we have to overcome. Um, they, they value their independence a lot. Um, at UCSD, at least I think it's probably true every, in all the UCs, the, the philosophy is to hire the most excellent candidate you can find no matter what they actually study. So you don't say, we need somebody who specializes in alternative energy. You say, we want somebody in, um, in engineering and we'll take the best engineering candidate we can find and whatever field of engineering he studies or she studies, that's fine, that's what we'll teach, and we want people to get excellence. And so there's no strategic plan for filling in the academic holes that you would need to have a well-rounded sustainability program. Um, and, and the research is driven by the availability of funding and by, by the curiosity of the investigators. And that doesn't always get you to the topics that you think need to be studied. Now, the good news is that the federal stimulus money is um, bringing the and increasing the correlation between the problems we think are important and the availability of funding because they've made such a big investment in uh, climate and science and, sustain and energy related funding. Um, some other challenges in governance. The biggest one is leadership. On our campus, sustainability is important, but it's certainly not the thing the chancellor lives and breathes. It's not what she gets up in the morning saying, I want this campus to be the sustainability research beacon of America. Mike Crow at Arizona State does, but our chancellor has a few other things on her mind. And, um, and excellence is a bigger factor for her. If you hear her talk about the values driving the campus, excellence is a higher rating than solving the world's problems. I mean, she thinks that by having excellence, we will solve the world's problems, but the, the process is a little different. It takes leadership. It's hard to do change. And unless every level of the organization is working in the same direction, you won't get the commitment you need to make the change. Shared governance. Nobody on a UC campus can make a decision in the administration without the support of the faculty, and the faculty need the support of the administration. And the result of that is a very slow decision-making process. To create an administration faculty task force takes a year. You need the committee on committees and the academic senate to appoint members of the working group and on and on and on. So it's a, it's a big bureaucracy. Um, and we don't have an overarching framework or strategy on sustainability. We talk about the campus as a living laboratory, but we haven't committed our campus to solving the water problem or committed our campus to solving the energy problem. Um, we have excellence and initiative across the campus, but there's no formal integrative mechanism. There's no obvious leader of the whole thing. And so you've got these sort of dueling fiefdoms, and they're all really good, and there's no reason for any of them to relinquish their role, their authority, their leadership to anybody else. And they haven't quite gotten, figured out how to work together. Um, so on the resource side, we have few internal incentives or resources for innovative interdisciplinary initiatives. Money goes to departments, to deans, development people, the staff who go out and raise money, report to the deans, the communication staff promotes the activities within the departments, and there's no extra staff to do to support the interdisciplinary <laughs> thing. So you have to sort of borrow from the various deans whose departments are involved in sustainability activities. Um, there's higher risk, there's higher overhead, so we have to go We get external money to do these things. Public funding sources are hard to find and they're not often well funded. There is no Federal Department of Sustainability that puts out RFPs that we can respond to. So it takes some creative hunting to find the right opportunities to get public funding. And um, corporate funding may be available, but sometimes it comes with baggage. Um, so would you want a Walmart fellowship or a Walmart research center? I mean, it's a serious question. We, we actually went and pitched to Walmart 
to fund graduate fellowships and sustainability, and we had a big debate about whether we should do it or not, and they didn't fund us anyway, so we didn't have to have to come to that conclusion. Walmart's doing amazing stuff in sustainability. They're also treating their laborers, their workers, really badly. So, you know, what's the right thing to do? Do you want the Exxon Energy Research Center on your campus? I mean, BP gave all this money to Berkeley, and there were big protests about it. Um, and so different campuses and different people have different values. The, the point is it comes with baggage, and you have to make decisions about what corporate funding you, you're comfortable with or not. Um, and philanthropists are interested in these things, but they don't necessarily get what sustainability means. So they might want to fund the engineering school because they're alums of engineering or fund some particular project. But if we asked at our, our campus how many professors work on sustainability, very few would raise their hands. A lot of them do work on sustainability, but they don't identify themselves that way. And likewise, donors don't always identify themselves as being interested in that. Foundations don't always have a funding line called sustainability. So it just takes some extra work to, to interpret what it means and find the right sources. Roger Revelle, who's revered at UCSD, uh, got it right quite a while ago with this quote. So the final piece I want to talk about is how universities create the future through example. And this is our little bragging part. I've told you all the problems and shared some of our dirty laundry at UCSD, but we're doing amazing things to green our campus. Um, and I know you are too here at Irvine. Um, UCSD is like a small city. We have 45,000 people on campus and 8,000 residents, and we operate 24-7. So you can see how our electricity demand compares to San Diego State, to Qualcomm, which is one of the bigger companies in town, and to the city of San Diego, which is not all the residents of San Diego. It's the municipal operation for the city of San Diego. In terms of square feet, we would be one of the largest landlords in San Diego. We control 13 million square feet of facility space, bigger than the city of San Diego or Qualcomm or San Diego State. Um, and as I mentioned, we have 8,000 students who live on campus. Is that about, uh, Irvine's smaller than that, right? I didn't look Small up your Small number statistic. on campus. I, I think it's about the same. About size. the same? Okay. Um, our carbon footprint, we are members of the California Climate <coughs> Action Registry. We're members of the Chicago Climate Exchange. We have been monitoring our carbon emissions for some time, 197,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, again, bigger than the other big players in San Diego. Um, we've become more energy efficient, but we're still growing, and so our emissions, unfortunately, have been going up. We generate 80% of our electricity on campus through a cogeneration plant powered by natural gas, and we convert that into electricity on campus, and we're getting um, 20 gigawatt hours of renewable energy now from our new photovoltaics and other sources, but we're also still one of the top customers of San Diego Gas and Electric. On the operation side, uh, we have some challenges too. We're very energy intensive, running all the labs. Um, a lot of them run 24-7. We, we have hospitals that take a lot of electricity. We're building new buildings, a billion dollars of new construction every five years. The state budget and unfunded mandates, you're all familiar with them, I'm sure. So we're putting new technology in old buildings, trying to make them more energy efficient. And you can see by the graph down here that we have become more energy efficient, but as I said, we're still growing, and so our total consumption um, is going up. But we've spent $60 million in energy retrofits, um, reducing energy use by 20% a year and saving $12 million a year in the existing buildings. We're making our new buildings newer and greener. The UC system standard requirement now for new construction is to be LEEDS compliant. LEED being the green building standard, and UCSD has committed to have all of our new buildings to be LEED silver rated. Um, we are investing in alternative transportation. We now call our parking permits hunting licenses to uh, hunt for a parking space because we don't have enough spaces for all the people that get permits. Um, and there's a very strong push to get people out of their individual cars. Our campus buses are fueled by 20% uh, biodiesel and they're being converted to uh, compressed natural gas 
we've got a deal with Nissan where we're getting some of the new Leaf electric vehicles, and we have Priuses as our campus rental fleet, which I hope we're having retrofitted to deal with the uh, safety issues these days. But that's another point. Um, we're putting in a CNG fueling station and converting our buses to CNG. The students got together on the campus and created one, uh, one of our shuttle buses that goes from downtown San Diego to the campus called the Green Line Shuttle that's 100% biodiesel. And through a student organization, they got the engine donated and a brand new bus. And so we run that on the longest bus line we have. And they're doing research to evaluate the um, emissions from it as a research project in um, atmospheric chemistry and mechanical and aerospace engineering. We have a lot of solar panels on our campus, and we have wonderful computer science students who put together this cool part of the presentation. I just borrowed it. Um, that those are all the places where we have solar panels. And we've got a, it's, it's actually an interesting story. The reason we have all of this, in part, is because of a parent. Um, four years ago, a guy named Byron Washam appeared on campus. He contacted the provost of Sixth College and said, hi, my name is Byron Washam. My son just enrolled here. And wherever my son goes, I go. I'm in alternative energy. How can I help you? And the provost said, oh, um, hi, just a minute. And then she called me on the phone and said, Lisa, this guy's here, and this is what he told me. What do I do with him? And so we introduced him to the people who run the campus. And he has been helping us. He now works for UCSD as our director of strategic energy. You met him at one of our conferences, yeah. Richard. Um, and he has helped us learn about OPM, which stands for Other People's Money. Um, you, may, you may be aware that you know, when you put solar panels on your roof at home, you get a rebate from the government, a tax write-off. But the university doesn't pay taxes, so getting a rebate for installing solar panels doesn't really help us at all because we don't pay taxes anyway. But if we rent our roofs, to somebody in the private sector who does pay taxes, they can buy the solar panels, put them on our roofs, sell us the electricity, we get an assured supply of electricity at a fixed price, and we get it at a bargain because the person we're buying it from got the tax benefit of installing the solar panels, and we didn't have to go to the state and ask for money to, to pay for the solar panels. So we have solar on our parking structures on the top level. We have what are called solar trees providing shade and, elect and generating electricity. We have solar on our buildings, and it's all through this parent helping us make connections with people in the private sector to do these third-party purchase agreements for photovoltaics. It's actually pretty cool. Um, we're diverting 67% of our waste, and we have a goal of becoming uh, zero waste by 2020. And I think there's a UC system-wide target to do that, so you guys are, I'm sure, working on the same issues. Last year, I taught a freshman seminar with a market research professor where we had freshmen doing focus groups, surveys, and observational studies to look at student recycling <coughs> behavior when you go into the dining halls. Do you recycle? If so, what, what makes you do it? If you don't, why not? What could we do to make to increase the amount of recycling on campus? And a lot of it was really simple stuff like the bins look different in different parts of the campus and we're never really sure what we should put in them. And some of them just say bottles only and we don't know if we can put paper in them and, and those kinds of things. And the campus has, we presented the results of these studies to the campus operations people and they've been working on making consistent signage everywhere, putting big displays that say this goes in here, this goes in here, you know, pictures of everything and having it all look the same and making sure that there's a recycling bin next to every trash bin so you don't have to walk across the room, God forbid, to drop your, your recycling stuff in the recycle bin. There are a lot of really simple things, but somebody has to point it out to you, and it, some of it takes a little bit of money. Um, our housing and dining services have their own sustainability manager, and she has a budget to fund green initiatives in the housing in the dining halls. Uh, campus forest management plan, we're paying attention to the things that grow on our campus and sequester carbon. So rather than buy offsets somewhere else in the world, we're offsetting on our own campus by planting trees and measuring how much they contribute. We're um, increasing the amount of reclaimed water we use, the purple pipes for irrigation around the campus. And we're looking at some innovative water ideas. This one is a dream, but it might come true to use the very cold water from an offshore uh, deep water canyon, very close to shore, but it's um, off of Scripps, 
We pipe chilled water through the campus as part of the heating and cooling system, and we use energy to chill the water before we send it through the pipes, but if we could get really cold water from the ocean and pipe that up to the campus, we could use that um, as the source of the coldness and save um, $4 million a year in energy and 100 million gallons of water per year by using seawater in a closed system. It would just come up to campus, get warmed up, we would take the it would absorb some of the heat from our local water and then go back into the ocean and save us from using electricity for that. The problem is it's an area of special biological significance. It has to get permitted by the Coastal Commission. Uh, we're talking about years of politics and um, process. The engineering is easy, but the, the permitting is very difficult. Um, Off-peak wind, because we run a cogeneration plant on campus, we can control the amount of electricity we generate on, on time scales of minutes, seconds to minutes. So some of these native wind farms have a lot of um, excess wind from time to time. A big, big gust will come through and they've got contracts to sell a certain amount of wind, but if more than that is generated, it's just wasted right now. And we can take it on a very short notice, you know, two minutes they say, big, big wind gust coming in, we can power down our cogeneration plant use less natural gas and use the wind energy instead on 24-7. Whenever it happens, we can use it and just stop burning natural gas. So we can, we're can we negotiating a deal to get the excess wind from the native wind farm near us and the Tehachapi Reservation. And just an example of how this smart grid works on our campus, in 2007 when we had the wildfires, the red line is how much electricity the campus was using. And the blue line is how much we were um, taking from the grid. That's right. Oh, I'm sorry, the blue line is how much we were generating from our cogeneration plant, and the red line is how much we were using. And the, the space in between is how much we were buying from the grid. And we got a call from SDG&E saying that these fires were affecting their transmission. Could we cut back on our use? And we went into our emergency mode and cut back on our use. That's where the red line drops down. And then they said, oh, we lost a generator. Can you help make up some of the electricity that we lost the capacity to generate? And so where the blue line goes up above is where we're putting energy back, electricity back into the grid for other people to use who are not on our campus. That won us big brownie points with SDG&E. Um, Fuel cells, we have another fire and wash them, other people's money project, um, a fuel cell going in on the east part of the campus, 2.8 megawatts, and it is powered, will be powered by waste gas from the Point Loma wastewater treatment plant. So um, it will be using what would be greenhouse gases going up into the atmosphere, instead using it to generate clean electricity at no capital outlay for the campus. And we just got money from some of the stimulus programs to put in an advanced energy storage system, some kind of high-tech batteries that I didn't understand, 11.2 um, megawatts of energy storage. Because the energy doesn't, renewable energy doesn't always happen when you need it. So this is just a graph of solar energy output on a nice, clear, sunny day. You can predict it. You know, the sun comes up, you get a lot of electricity, and then it goes down. But not every day, even in San Diego, is sunny or in Irvine. And sometimes clouds come by. And when clouds come by, then your output from a solar system looks more like this. And that's really hard to manage a system when you've got that kind of erratic input. So with this advanced energy storage, we can store the excess when we don't need it and use it when we do need it and smooth all that out. So we're putting all this together in a state-of-the-art San Diego energy park on the east side of the campus that will have um, an algae park up here in the upper left, um, a visitor center. We have a project on green cyber infrastructure. I guess you already had a talk about green cyber infrastructure, um, taking server computer servers out of buildings and putting them in these. We have something called Project Greenline, putting them in storage containers, cargo containers that are specially designed um, for thermal efficiency for, for uh, computer servers, and then you don't have to chill the whole building to accommodate the computer equipment that's on the ground floor. Um, so some of these pieces exist, some of them are dreams, but we will eventually get there, I'm convinced. Um, and finally, the most important part is the students. Um, I've mentioned students in the education and the research part. This is the um, ribbon cutting for our Sustainability Resource Center, which was a student initiative that uh, um, will be LEED certified platinum, I think, all the 
the components were donated by local merchants, recycled materials. It's um, a place for with a library with gathering, meeting time, and so on. We have a group called Aquaholics Anonymous, a student group that is advocating a 12-point program for reducing water consumption on campus. Um, and they've had they had a water month and do a lot of educational programs. They're now putting a native garden around the faculty club to reduce our irrigation needs for uh, the campus landscape. And TGIF, you all have a TGIF program here at Irvine, the, the Green Initiative Fund, the student fee. We're latecomers to this this year. The, first, the fee was voted last year, and this is the first year we actually have money. About $80,000 is being given out. Um, the first half has been awarded, and the second half is the solicitation is out, and um, awards will be made next month. So um, it's a whirlwind tour of the UCSD and the University Sustainability Activities. Um, to wrap up, what I said was student, uh, universities create the future through education, through discovery, through example. I think I've shown you how all that works. We're constrained or enhanced by our culture, our governance, governance systems, and our resources. So together, we're creating this future or this future. Either way, it's the universities that are creating the future. Thank you.